Hey guys, welcome back to the shop and to the first ever Metallurgy Monday. Now it's it's mostly a name because I think it's kind of a cool name, but it's also encompassing what we're trying to do here and primarily, not always, but primarily it's going to be talking about practical metallurgy when it comes to bladesmithing and knife making and maybe even just blacksmithing a little bit in general. There's a lot of information online these days. You know, 25 years ago when I started making knives, you could get books from the library and there was maybe a tiny bit of stuff online, but compared to today, there's there's no comparison. However, a lot of that information is subpar. You can get a lot of different opinions or, you know, different advice that may or may not be accurate. And then a lot of it is good information, but you know, knowing how to apply it can sometimes be difficult. And so the goal here is to take all of the good information and distill it down into some practical application here. So I've read uh, a number of metallurgy books, uh, done quite a bit of study online, and I, by quite a bit, I mean over years of time from various different sources, multiple different sources, and uh, learned from other bladesmiths and so on and so forth. And I've made hundreds of knives here and, and do this on a almost daily basis. So I want to bring that information to you in a distilled practical uh, fashion here. So that's the purpose of this. And so I appreciate the support as a channel member. So thank you very much. I thought that we could uh, perhaps start a series that starts with real basic information and sort of moves up and we might do that. But today what I want to do is be even more practical, I suppose, and work with something we actually have going on in the shop right now. So I'm gonna pull a knife out of the kiln here. This is the last tempering cycle for this blade here. It's obviously cooled down overnight. And what we have here is a 200 layer pattern welded Damascus steel. And of course, as with all pattern welded steels, it's made from two different steels. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. This is 80 CRV2 and 15 and 20. The reason you use two different steels, of course, in a, in a pattern weld, two or more, I should say, in pattern weld of steel is to achieve a contrasting pattern. And you layer that steel up, and most of you are probably familiar with it, whether you've done it yourself or uh, watched a video on it on my channel or, or on many other channels. But what I want to talk about today is the heat treating. So this is two different kinds of steels, and they have different uh, chemical compositions. Now. If you're familiar with pattern welded steel, having a steel that has a high nickel content of one and a half to two percent is important because combining that with a high carbon steel that does not have nickel content is going to give you that contrasting pattern. That high carbon steel without the nickel is going to be a darker color and the nickel content steel is a light or bright or silver sort of color. In the final product, after you've etched it in some kind of etchant, whether it's uh, ferric chloride or hydrochloric acid, something like that. I use ferric chloride. So if you have two different steels with different compositions, how is it that you can heat treat a knife that has two different steels in it and wind up with a good or excellent product, an excellent blade steel with excellent metallurgy? And we're gonna talk about that. I make uh, knives pattern welded steel knives from a, a variety of combinations including like this 80 CRV2 and 15 and 20, 50 to 100 and 15 and 20 and then uh, you know I've used 1095, 1075, 1080, 1084, uh, 01, all these different steels as the high carbon steel and simply because 15 and 20 is sort of the main uh, nickel content steel that you can actually get and use that's the other steel in all these all these blades interesting side note in the past uh, and not so much anymore I believe uh, bladesmiths would use low carbon steel as the contrasting steel because since it doesn't have the carbon content the final etch on it is sort of a light color it's not bright like the nickel content steel, but it is a light color, more of a ghostly white, if you will. And so it does provide that contrast. Now, that particularly is not going to apply to what we're talking about today. 15 and 20 is very similar to 1080 steel, except for it has the nickel content. So it's got about 0.8% carbon, and then uh, you know a few other small alloy components, and then the nickel. It's rather different than 50 to 100, for example, which has 
1% uh, carbon and 1.5% chromium and, and no nickel. And so you've got the nickel steel, which is sort of the constant here for us, and then all these different steels. The reason that you can heat treat this blade and wind up with a good heat treat for both steels has to do with the carbon content in solution when you quench the blade. Now, early on, I, uh, and I'm right early on, I mean uh, probably six or seven, maybe eight years ago, I discovered uh, 52100 steel. Now, obviously, a lot of uh, bladesmiths and knife makers were using it for a long time prior to me discovering it, but I was impressed with it on paper and I thought, hey, this is, this is great because it has, the, has a higher carbon content than uh, uh, 1095, for example, but it's got this chromium content that really helps control the uh, grain size and, and gives that toughness and so forth. And also helps with the uh, hardenability of the steel. So I thought it was really great. So I went online and was looking on some forums trying to find some advice for heat treating. And most of what I found at that time, people were talking about uh, putting the carbon into solution and the, the necessary austenitizing temperatures to do that. And they were talking about putting all of the 1% carbon into solution and then doing something to correct the inevitable uh, retained austenite. Retained austenite is where you have steel that stays in the austenitic phase after you quench it. The goal is to turn all of that austenite into martensite, which is why you quench it. If you have some that's not turning into martensite, it's called retained austenite. Retained austenite is, as you would expect, soft, um, and it's not at a high temperature anymore, but it's still austenite, it's soft, it's not gonna hold an edge. It can add some toughness to the blade, but overall it's, a, it's not what you want in a, in a blade. And so, there was uh, talk and, and ideas of, of using a cold treatment of some type, whether it would be a dry ice or cryogenic, like liquid nitrogen, to convert that retained austenite. Because when you have a high carbon content, particularly, and then especially when it's combined with a high or, or any kind of alloy component, then it slows the ability of the steel to convert, or it retards the ability of the steel to convert fully. And so people were trying to figure out ways to uh, fix the problem that they created. And uh, so basically the, the long story short is that I saw all this information and I was like, well darn, I don't want to have to cold treat all the blades that I make. Like that's not really the goal here. Um, like, you know, with, with high alloy stain and stainless steels, that's necessary. There's really no way around it um, to, to get, well, let me back that up. If you're going to heat treat a certain way with a high level of, of uh, carbon in solution, then you have to do that. There are other ways of heat treating high alloy and high stainless, high, uh, high, uh, high carbon stainless steels, but I digress. So I didn't want to have to cold treat my 5200 steel blades. I was looking for a, you know, a uh, high carbon steel that was of more traditional uh, usage and so forth, and so. For a long time, or for a couple years, I guess I should say, I did not use 52100 steel, and uh, I was under the impression that it wasn't really a good fit for my shop because it didn't have the uh, heat treatability, basically. I didn't want to have to use cold treatments. What I didn't know, and what all those other people didn't know, is that, and I'll just to put it plainly, just because a steel has a certain carbon content to it, does not mean, and in fact, most of the time, I can't think of when it would, but I'll just say most of the time, because you know, there's always exceptions. Most of the time, you don't want to put all that carbon in solution. And, and the reasons are for what we just talked about, because you're going to get retained austenite. Not only that, but let's, let's uh, delve a little further into this. There are more than one kind of martensite. And martensite being that hard phase of steel that is created when you quickly cool steel from the austenitic phase. Traps that carbon in there and, and uh, creates a stress or tension within the structure of the steel, and that's what gives you that hardness. 
but there's actually two different kinds of martensite. The first one is lath martensite, and the second is plate martensite. And the basic difference between those two is how much carbon is being used, so to speak, to create this martensite. In the first, the lath martensite, you're using enough carbon to create a certain amount of hardness. But if you go beyond that, then you're starting to create plate martensite. And you might gain a little bit of hardness, but you are losing toughness because plate martensite, and martensite is even more brittle <clears throat> than lath martensite. And so, uh, in the final analysis, the preferable martensitic structure is the lath martensite, not the plate. So you can, in fact, have both retained austenite and plate martensite in the same blade. So you not only have areas of softness that are undesirable, you also have areas of extra brittleness that's also undesirable. So it's kind of interesting, but both are not good. And so it, it really does not help you to put all of that carbon into solution. So what is the answer? Well, the answer lies in the austenitic uh, temperature, the temperature that you austenize at. Depending on the alloy component for a particular steel, you um, will have to raise the temperature to a certain level in order to allow a certain amount of carbon to go into solution. Uh, and the reason the alloy component is important is because if you have alloy component, that's going to, again, retard that, the ability of that carbon to move into solution. And so with certain amounts of alloy component, that austenitic temperature may or almost inevitably will have to be raised. But the goal is to put between 0.6 and 0.8% carbon into solution and, and no more than that. So you might ask, what's the point of having more carbon in your steel? Well, that's a good question. And the answer to that is that the excess carbon resides in the structure of the steel as uh, iron carbides. And those are tiny, hard particles that provide abrasion resistance in the edge of that blade and make a better knife. And so that's why you have higher carbon steels even though you're not trying to put all that carbon into solution. So the goal is to put between 0.6 and 0.8% carbon into solution. And as I mentioned earlier, the way that you do that is the austenitizing temperature. You are going to have to study your specific or particular steel to know precisely what that temperature is. But I will say that by and large, that's going to be between 1450 and 1500 degrees, okay? That's, that's just a fact. Until you start getting into the outer ranges of less than 0.6, 7% carbon or more than, well, or more alloy content because um, your 1075 is going to put the same amount of carbon into solution as your uh, 1095 or your 125CR1 at the same austenizing temperature. Very practically speaking, I austenitize at the same temperature for that range of steels and for the 5200 as well because although it does have <clears throat> excuse me it does have a uh, alloy component it's not enough to greatly affect that to overcome that you simply need to hold it and this is important you need to hold it at that temperature uh, for a more extended period of time about 15 minutes something like that once you raise that temperature above this range you are going to put more carbon into solution and then you're going to start getting into retained austenite uh, plate martensite and you're going to uh, damage the quality of your blade. Now this is not the full picture and this is what's so great about going to be so great about Metallurgy, Metallurgy Mondays going forward because we're taking a snapshot of one part of the process but this is this is how you heat treat a blade with more with one or more different steels in it and this is how you can do that. So let's talk about tempering really fast. Once you have a controlled amount of carbon into solution, then your tempering process is going to be very close for those steels that have the same or a similar amount of carbon into solution. Does that make sense? And so I can take this blade and temper it out and uh, both steels are gonna be similar enough. Now, these, these two particular steels, the ADCRV2 and the 15 and 20 are not super dissimilar. They both have the same amount of carbon content. So this particular blade probably isn't the uh, the most uh, effective uh, 
um, example of what we're actually talking about here today, but it's the one that I have. These guys right here are going to be heat treated, and they are uh, 52100 and 15 and 20, so they're a little more uh, relevant to the discussion. Uh, but you know, ADCRV2 does have some alloy components, and so there is a little bit of difference. And uh, either way, that's how that works. Um, now, of course, your your uh, the condition of your steel leading up to austenitizing and uh, different things like that are important, but those are all things for a, a, a different video. You know, and, and steels below uh, like 0.7% carbon, that's, a, that's another story. All kinds of great stuff to talk about, but that is how you heat treat a blade with more than one kind of steel in it. So hopefully this was uh, informative for you guys and, and, and sort of opens a window more into what we do as bladesmiths because yeah, you can heat up a thing and stick it in a, uh, a thing of oil and you know get some okay results. But personally, and I think you guys as well, are looking to delve deeper and, and, and pull better and better results out of our work. So appreciate you guys watching. Thanks for joining the channel membership here. And we will see you on the next Metallurgy Monday.